too busy. I also want to warn you, um, I'll try not to speak too quickly. I'm very much aware that English is not the first language of many of you. So um, if I do speak quickly, just motion, give me some hand motion. I was brought up in New York City in a tough neighborhood. And as an early boy, I had to learn either to speak fast or fight well. And I chose to speak fast. Nature made the choice for me, actually. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little today about what I think is the most important subject I could talk to you about, which is how ideas and knowledge work in the world, especially in development and in productivity. Uh, I'll talk for about half an hour. Maybe one of you could signal to me when half an hour is up. And then we could open the uh, discussion for people to talk, ask questions, whatever they prefer to do. About 10 years ago, I was working at the World Bank, and the chief economist at the time was a man named Joseph Stiglitz, who um, was a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Stiglitz said that the only source, the only source of competitive advantage for a country in the 21st century would be the global search for and appropriation of new ideas. The global search for and appropriation of new ideas. This is at the very heart of development and productivity, new ideas. If you think about it in a very wide way, there's only two ways to increase productivity in any company, organization, or any country. You can get people to work faster, harder, or you can get them to work smarter. Working smarter entails new ideas, or ideas you haven't used before. They don't have to be new to the planet. They just have to be new either to your country or to your organization. I recently read a report that was fascinating on the subject that said that about, this is by McKinsey, the big consulting firm I used to work for. They said approximately 80% of the ideas any organization needs to be more productive already exist. They're just not put into place in that organization. So they're in the world. We're not talking about ideas of immortality or flying to Mars where we don't have the ideas. We're talking about ideas that are present in the world. And often they're available. They're often accessible. But you're not using them. Your country or your organizations aren't using them. That's the sort of, to my mind, that's the heart of what we're talking about here in terms of productivity and in terms of development. So I'd like to talk a little about how to do such things, how organizations do these things, and some steps perhaps you could take. Again, this is a short talk on a very complex subject, so we could just the sort of the introduction of the subject. So some of the work in the roadmap that's under discussion would be taking this further. So let's talk very little, I don't want to put you to sleep early in the morning, but let's talk a very little bit about history, how we got to the spot place we are. I, I, I wanted to say at the beginning, I'm sorry I forgot to, that I'd like to thank very much APO for inviting me here. I, I should have said that right away, I'm sorry. It, to me, it's absolutely fascinating to speak to representatives of 20 different nations with such different histories, different cultures, different backgrounds. I found this very, very exciting. So. I'm very happy to be here. We're entering an absolutely unprecedented stage in world history. Absolutely unprecedented. I can guarantee this is true. A long time ago, I was a professor of world history. <laughs> so I know what I'm talking about, at least in this regard. And this, the difference between this stage is that we have knowledge democratization in the world. This has never been the case before, never where that generally everything that can be known or is known is available to people through technology and they have the freedom in general way to access this knowledge, to use this knowledge, especially a certain type of knowledge that I'm going to be talking about, which is know-how, practical knowledge, know-how. We're not talking about art, philosophy, music, or poetry. I very much like those subjects, I'm sure many of you do, but that's not what I'm here for. We're talking about the ability to make things, the ability to grow things, the technical and practical ability to raise levels of income and raise a nation's productivity. 
that knowledge was spread sort of evenly around the world in maybe the year 1500. But for all sorts of reasons we can't go in here, into here, slowly three parts of the world developed a monopoly on that type of knowledge and repressed it in other parts of the world, some of the parts of the world you people are from. Those three places that had this power were Western Europe, the United States, and Japan. And they sort of kept the knowledge down in some of the countries that you represent. They wouldn't encourage people to develop factories, to develop universities, for all sorts of colonial and economic reasons. That monopoly really lasted from about 1870 to about 1960, that period of time. What happened? What, what broke that monopoly up? Well, the biggest event was the Second World War. Europe could not sustain its dominance of certain areas. They would have liked to. The French would have liked to have kept North Africa. England certainly would have liked to have kept India, places in Southeast Asia. And Japan probably would have liked to have kept many of the Jap uh, colonies or countries they colonized too. No one could do it because Europe and Japan destroyed themselves in wars. The United States didn't destroy itself, so it sort of was left with a monopoly. However, the world couldn't go backwards. And slowly but surely, countries that didn't have the capacity to develop or use this practical knowledge got it. They got it. And many of you represent such countries. And you could see it, the knowledge spreading around the world, practical knowledge, because it couldn't be suppressed. It couldn't be dominated by other parts. It became more democratized. The era from 1970 to the present is an era of the democratization of useful knowledge. In 1968, I was a very young man in 1968, <laughs> And I had graduated university and went around the world because I didn't want to fight in one of the periodic wars the United States gets into. And among the places I stopped in, I went with a few friends, and we constantly ran out of money, so we had to stop and ask our parents to send us money. Among the places I stopped at was Malaysia, South India, and Ireland, just to pick three. Those countries were really, uh, they had no vibrancy. They had no economic life to speak of. They still were pretty post-colonial, I'd say. Well, I don't have to tell anyone in this room, they're nothing like that anymore. I, I'm coming to Bangkok, which wasn't colonized, but still part of a general area. Just look around you and look at the countries you represent. The world is becoming democratized in terms of practical knowledge, the ability to do science, the ability to run factories, the ability to build new industries. It's a different world than any that had ever been seen before. And it makes a huge difference in when we're talking about the implications for productivity and development. There's sort of no excuses. <laughs> any country, any company within a country can, with the right structures, the right incentives, the right will, can become developed and develop their productivity. There's nothing stopping them. Sometimes their own governments do, but that's, that's not the case here. So it's a new era. Unfortunately, a lot of economic thinking and a lot of business thinking and political thinking haven't caught up to this yet. So we're still sort of in a, if you go to school and study certain things, it's not, it takes universities a lot of years to catch up to what the world really looks like or how the world acts. But it's true nonetheless. It's a democratized knowledge situation. So what does this mean for us? Why am I telling you this? It's fun to talk about. It's a very interesting subject. And it's not spoken about that often. But among the things that are really important is that what, are the, what is the role of ideas in this world? And how do ideas move? How do ideas captured? How do ideas work in this economy? And there's a couple of points I really want to make that I'm sick with you. One is, there's nothing more important than ideas. Nothing, 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 nothing. It beats geography. <laughs> I mean, there's some interesting, huge amount of studies done on 
how important is geography to economic development and productivity, I certainly believe it's not that important. I have presented to you the cases of countries that have very poor, poor in terms of resource poor geographies, yet are wealthy countries. Is, is someone here from Korea, for example? Yeah. There's a very famous World Bank study that compares Korea and Nigeria over the last 40 years. So 40 or 50 years ago, excuse me, 50 years ago, they had very similar GNP per capita. I'm sure all of you know Nigeria is blessed by nature. There's nothing you could want that probably isn't in Nigeria in terms of natural resources. With all due respect, what Korea has is Koreans. They don't have any natural resources to speak of. But their GNP was similar 50 years ago. If I'm not mistaken, about three or four months ago, Korea passed England in GNP per capita. They passed England, something that probably nobody in the world would have predicted. Nobody would have predicted that. And yet it happened. And what made it happen? They appropriated and used ideas from around the world, developed them developed their capacity for using ideas and became a wealthy nation. It's an astounding story, and it's a story that Japan did in the 19th century. A very, very similar story. So we have two very interesting cases. And it's a story that's being replicated in India, I would say, too. So ideas are astoundingly valuable. Think about, I'll pick just two companies in the United States that Today I read that Apple is going to be the first trillion dollar company that ever lived, ever existed. Trillion dollars. That's a lot of money for a company. It's not even a country, it's a company. What's Apple based on? What's the basis of that trillion dollars? I mean, we all own these little devices. I could look around and see. I mean, we buy them. Why do we buy them? Other companies had the technology for cell phones. Certainly they did for PCs. What did Apple have that allows them to be a trillion dollar company? Yeah, ideas. What are the major ideas they had? Design, the use of elegant equipment, ergonomic design, a lot of ideas. Google, which will, it's close behind Apple, they just had an algorithm. Two Russian emigres to the United States from Russia had an idea of how to do searches more effectively Google's worth about half of what Apple's worth, but it's still a very powerful company. This is the world of ideas. It's more valuable than geography. It's more valuable than historical success. Sometimes countries, like companies, they rest, they go to sleep because they're successful. We see that all the time. And yet, new ideas are always perking up. There are more ideas in the world than ever before because more people can do things than ever before. I have a relative who uh, took a PhD degree in chemistry 40 years ago at MIT. And he told me that 40 years ago, he could conquer the whole world of organic chemistry. He could learn everything he needed to learn to pass a PhD examination. One man, one set of ideas. I had lunch with him a few months ago, and he said that would be impossible now. There's so many more countries and people in countries doing organic chemistry, you could never conquer the whole field. You'd have to take a little bit of it and say, I know this little cut rather than the whole field. It's a totally different world. More people in more countries do organic chemistry than ever before. It was never done in some of the countries and it's done all over the world now because of universities, institutions, the money is there. It's a totally different situation. So what are these ideas worth to an economy? Recently, there was a report published, again, in the United States, but it's just as true anywhere, that if you took the 500 largest companies in the United States, including Apple and including Google and names you'd recognize, approximately 70% of their value, 70% of their value is in intangibles. It's not in equipment. It's not in the buildings. It's not in money. It's in intangibles. 
What are these intangibles? What do you think they are? Seven, that's a lot of money, 70%. Ideas, what else? There's other parts of this. Pardon? Well, systems, yes, somewhat, but that can be replicated easily. What, pardon? Human capital, what people know, ideas, absolutely. The experience of people, the know-how of people. And there's one other thing that's very valuable that would be very hard to just buy in the marketplace. Relationships in networks. Good relations, companies, have good relations with other companies. You can't buy it, you have to develop it, you have to do it. That's a lot of wealth that's not tangible. And it's not, it's hard to find it in textbooks. It's hard to find it in classes. What's the major reason it's not taught, what I'm talking about? Why don't people teach this? Why, don't, why, don't, why do I need to tell you about it? <laughs> It's hard to quantify. It's very hard to build equations around it. And when something isn't quantifiable, it's often not taught at universities because they think it's like poetry. It's not, it's not worth talking about. But it's like all things in life, the most valuable things in life aren't quantifiable. Love, family, philosophy, music, art, patriotism, spiritual matters, none of that's quantifiable, but most of us live our lives. So that's a huge amount, and yet we, don't, we ignore it. We don't talk about it. We talk about money, we talk about material goods, which can be replicated. It's, easy to, it's hard to have any competitive advantage compared to know-how, social capital, the, the returns you have from social relationships, social capital, networks, trust, and ideas. When a long time ago, again 50 years ago, uh, economists began to figure out what allows countries to be more developed, what allows for productivity. And a man named Robert Solo, who is a professor at MIT, who, who lives near me, uh, he's still alive, he's 90 years old. He said, well, we have money, we have labor, we have machinery, but there's something more. It can't just be those things. And he called it a residual, the residual. He didn't particularly break it down. He just said, there's something else. It's like the black matter in the universe. Huge amount of the universe is composed of stuff. No one knows what it is, but it's there. <laughs> he called it the residual. And he got the Nobel Prize for doing that. Maybe I'll get a Nobel Prize for talking about knowledge. Huh? Another man named Paul Romer, another economist who's now at NYU, said that that residual is mostly ideas. And he'll, he will get the Nobel Prize, because they not only say it, but they prove it. They prove that it's really ideas. And these are the gains that are made. But the difference is, if that's true, and I know it's true, it's absolutely true, any country can develop themselves better. Any organization can gain productivity gains. You don't need necessarily a great deal of money, a great deal of effort. You don't need geography. You need using ideas and putting them into practice. This is a really important thing to think about when you think about these issues. I'm not downgrading money and I'm not downgrading hard work and cultural values, not at all. But basically, it's ideas. As I said, about 80% of the gains in productivity are available to anyone. They're out there. It's knowledge that's there in the world that you can bring in and use. So having said that, what are the steps taken? I mean, it's nice to talk about these things, but what are the actual steps that an organization or a country, encouraging organizations, need to do to better use ideas. Pretty interesting when you think about it. Let me tell you a little story about this. Thing. Pardon? Education, absolutely. There's about five of them. Let me tell you a little story that would illustrate one way of doing this. That's, I just find this very interesting. 
about 10 years ago, I did some work with a company in Denmark. Denmark's a little country, five million people. Smart, they're happy, they're supposed to be the happiest country in the world. They look pretty, they drink a lot, they look pretty happy, they're all tall and blonde. But there are only five million people. You could drop Denmark into Bangkok, you probably wouldn't notice it's there. They, I was working with a very advanced company that built, that developed enzymes for decomposing waste into energy. Biomass conversion enzymes. Very high level stuff. They need new ideas constantly because this is a very big subject and it's done throughout the world. Very important subject if you think about it. They couldn't find the ideas in Denmark. There aren't enough scientists, there aren't enough institutions to do this in Denmark. So what they did, these people are the descendants of Vikings, people who went out in big boats and they looted and pillaged. <laughs> they weren't nice people back then. It's a nice country now, but it wasn't nice then. And they decided to have a program in this company to send three or four people out each year, give them their yearly salary, but send them around the world, say, bring back some new ideas. Talk to people. Go to conferences. Go to Brazil, where they are trying to do this biomass conversion, turning corn waste into energy, the ethanol. And you, you applied for this job, you got your full salary, here's some money, here's some tickets, go forth and bring back a new idea. And when they come, they came back after a year and they meet with a panel, sort of like, like that, five or six people, and they present the idea. And if it sounds workable, if it sounds good, if it sounds profitable, they give you more money. Here's more money, go develop the idea. All they need is one big success every five years, and it pays for the whole project. Why don't other organizations do this? <laughs> I can't understand why other countries and organizations don't meet with professors, go to conferences, go to libraries, hire some translators and read journals in different languages. The world is awash with ideas, but you have to find them. What Stiglitz said, the Global search for ideas, the global search. Don't just stay home. Get out, come to meetings like this. So, there are maybe five big categories, you mentioned one previously, that are really important for people like yourselves who are policy developers to focus on, to bring this world of ideas to fruition, to make it valuable. Certainly one is education. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. And here's the major reason why. It's not only, of course, humane and you have a better country if people are educated, that's just true. It's not enough to have ideas if the people involved in the country can't absorb and use the ideas. It's not enough just to have ideas. A while ago, Bill Clinton and William Gates, Bill Gates, got together. This sounds like a joke, but it's not. <laughs> I was in the room when this happened. They announced that if everyone in Africa that chose could get a cheap laptop computer, they'd become developed very quickly. Well, maybe that's true and maybe it isn't. But unless the young children in Africa were better developed, went to universities, went to schools, could read, could write, could understand what science is, could understand how things work, it's just a toy. If you, we, I've seen that in the United States. I was part of a program where we got very cheap computers made at MIT in Boston, where I live. And it was to give them to kids in poor neighborhoods. But those kids had no incentives. They had no cultural norms to use the computers. It was just a toy. They did a lot of gaming with it. They didn't go search for new ideas. Countries and people need what the, the term absorptive capacity. Without education, you, it, ideas just, it would be like if someone gave me a journal of nuclear physics. I might be able to read the words, maybe but it would have no meaning to me. I couldn't do anything with that. I don't have the absorptive capacity to work with advanced physics, not at all. Now think about that on a large scale. You, have to, you can't just have ideas. You can't just pay money for computers or technology. 
A lot of vendors try to sell you that idea, but it's wrong. You need basic core education so people can absorb ideas and use them. That's where the real human capital development comes in. And it's really important. None of this is going to work without that. Because there's no one to take the ideas and use them. It's not an, ideas on their own aren't enough. They're not enough. You know, it's an, it is an interesting historical uh, parallel with this. When England developed the Industrial Revolution, and they were the first country to really industrialize based on steam energy, other countries sent people to England to learn about how these steam engines worked, how to develop coal and iron using engines to drive fabric manufacturing, cotton, and so forth, along with steel and iron. And they got the ideas. They could spy on, they could talk to people. But they bring them back to their countries. But it took 40 to 50 years for those ideas to be socialized, for the ideas to actually become useful to people who could then understand what do you do with a steam engine? How do you build a steam engine? How do you use it? Ideas don't just become automatically implementable. They need people to socialize them. So again, education and absorptive capacity. Another thing that's really important in doing this is money. There is a role for capital. <laughs> I don't mean to be so idealistic, but there is. If those fellows who had that brilliant idea about algorithms who founded Google, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, if they didn't have access to a ton of money in Silicon Valley, there wouldn't be a Google. They might, other firms might do things like that. But you need money. You need fluid capital markets. If not internally, then externally. But you need access to money to turn an idea into something useful for productivity or development. It can't be done without it. It just doesn't work that way. But the world is awash with money. This isn't the problem. There's tons of money in the world looking for returns. There really is. No matter where you are, no matter what you're thinking, there's money. Because everyone wants higher returns because bonds and stocks and so forth. There's more people. There's more people retiring. And you need two more things where you should aim for two more things. These are all doable things. I'm not telling you to fly to Venus. You need knowledge institutions. Knowledge institutions. Universities. Think tanks. Places where knowledge can be developed and could be distributed. Distributed. I was doing a very, I'm still doing it, a big project for the Gates Foundation in northern India, Bihar. And um, they don't have knowledge institutions up there. They will one day, but they don't have them now. So it's very hard for medical and nursing knowledge, first aid knowledge, healthcare knowledge, to be distributed if there aren't institutions that collect the knowledge, use it, translate it for people to use, adapt it. You need knowledge institutions. Many countries, of course, are full up with this. Some of the countries in this room, US. But many of you could really use that. And that's something that could be built. That's something that can be made. A lot of you work in countries that are doing this, so you know what I'm talking about. But knowledge institutions, not just universities, think tanks, development institutions. And the last really important thing that isn't mentioned a lot, but is hugely valuable, is Connectivity. <laughs> this is a remarkable report published by the United Nations that ranked countries, I'll, I'll leave it up in the, the, out here, by how connected the people are to themselves and to the outside world. It ranks countries. It's a direct correlation between connectivity and economic success. Direct. Why is that so? You learn new ideas. You network and learn about how to do things differently. You find sources for money. You find sources of inspiration. And perhaps an intangible that we haven't mentioned, but is still valuable, you find people to talk to, to work with, within your country and outside, who'll help you. 
Oh, I'm feeling really discouraged. Nothing's working. I said, oh, keep your spirits up, you know. <laughs> Let's meet for a drink. It sounds very modest, but it's really important. It's really an important thing, connectivity. This can be done. This can be encouraged. This isn't something that esoteric. I mean, some people criticize this because they said, well, of course, the wealthier countries already have the connectivity because they buy the machines. But the price of connectivity has dropped dramatically, just dramatically. You don't need, and no one cannot afford to do this. There was a time when it would have been very expensive, but it's not, no longer. The other point I'd want to make that I would also encourage you to think about when you're talking about the role of ideas is spaces, spaces. This is a contribution that was made to the world of knowledge by uh, some Japanese theorists, Professor Nonaka and a few other people. They have a Japanese word for this, ba. Spaces are where people exchange knowledge, where groups meet to exchange knowledge. In classical Greek, they called it the agora. Uh, today, we don't always need physical spaces. We can meet online. You can meet in cyberspace, although I, I'm, I have a preference for physical space. This meeting is exactly what we're talking about. Where you come together and you develop collective meaning together. It's much more impactful than reading things. I mean, clearly, APO can de develop a lot of ideas, send you documents. They don't have to spend money or do all the rigmarole of coming to a place lovely as it is. It's a beautiful city here. But, there, but people still travel. I travel all the time. I'm sure some of you travel all the time. I know some of you do at APO. Why are the planes full? Ask yourself, it's a simple question. How come the planes are full? No one particularly loves traveling. <laughs> it's expensive. It's not dangerous, but it's expensive. It's sometimes very inconvenient. It's not always pleasant unless you can go with the highest level. Why do people seek out each other to exchange ideas rather than when they have a chance, rather than do it online? It has a higher emotional quotient. If I tell you something and we have a discussion about it live, it's much more impactful than if I write a letter. I mean, I flew here. I'm happy to be here, but it took me 30 hours to get here. I'm getting a little older, <laughs> but I'm happy to do it because this is the way to do such things. This is the best way to do it. So spaces are really key, and spaces where people can meet live and talk. Travel, get out of your office, encourage your people to travel, encourage your companies to travel. No one knows, someone how do I, how is this said? It's said in French by a French philosopher, Montaigne. People their knowledge is dependent on where they stand. If you just stay in one place, all you know is what's going on in that one place. One of the worst uh, disasters we had in America was President George Bush, his son, who um, he had only been out of the United States twice before he was elected president. He's a man 50 years old, had a lot of money. He had only left the country. I knew right away he'd be a disaster. You can't run a large country and never have been out of the country. All you know are the things in the country. You have no understanding of other things. So getting out, traveling, the world is full of ideas. The world is full of people doing things. And if you don't leave, if you don't travel, if you don't get out and talk to them, you're going to be at a disadvantage. One of the singular worst things for countries to do is restrict access to travel or restrict access to the internet or restrict access to thinking about ideas. You can't win. <laughs> it's a no-win situation. Life just doesn't work that way. So I think I've spoken for about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, I could go on like this for the rest of the day. You could try. It's the only thing I could still do physically, probably as well as anyone in this room. But some of you must have some comments. I know you're a little shy, some of the English isn't your first language. Some of you must have some comments, some questions, things you'd like to add to this. So I wonder, good. Uh, in the global situation, uh, especially ideas, opinions, and you know, new things are kind of uh, stolen or maybe exploited. 
if I say that, what's your opinion? Are you asking me what should be done about that? Or? Yeah, it is there. You know, in the global open uh, yeah. systems, right? Uh, most of the ideas came from the maybe the underdeveloped countries, something like that. Ideas are exploited, right? You're right, they are. Stolen, yes. They are, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You know, there was a time, the country Belgium used to make beautiful lace. Belgium was famous in Europe for its lace. And the Belgians, it, if they caught you selling the secrets of how to make lace, they'd shoot you. <laughs> but the lace got out. Every knowledge will get out because of technology. You can't keep it in. You could try. You could try to protect it. You could do your best. But there's almost nothing that won't get out in time. So where does that leave you? Where does that leave all of us? A very competitive and tricky world. Everything gets out. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to, oh, yeah, you got to hold it. It gets out because of cheap technology. It's called lowering the information transaction cost, if I want to speak as an economist. It used to be very expensive to move information around, and you could protect it. You can keep it inside. Very expensive. Today, now information transaction cost is zero. I once saw a demonstration, I was at IBM for a number of years, and they showed us once about 30 CD disks and said those disks contain all the books in the Library of Congress in Washington. Library of Congress has 70 million books, <laughs> and they could put them on all these disks. So there's no transfer value, there's no transfer cost for information. It goes around. Knowledge is still expensive. If it wasn't, everyone would know the same thing. There's a famous article, very useful article, and it's something you should think about. Why isn't the whole world developed? Why are there such differences between countries? It's a very, very interesting issue. Now, at one time, we said, yes, some countries suppressed other countries. There was colonialism and imperialism. They just had guns, they had armed ships, and they could suppress another country. That's gone. That's almost gone. So why isn't the whole world developed? Maybe it will get developed. I think it will converge. But for our purposes today, it's not the case. And you have to think, why is that so? Because knowledge still has costs. You have to learn how to do things. You have to teach people how to do things. It's not free. It takes time, education, institutions, incentives. It's not a cheap thing to do. It's the only game in town, but it takes time and money. Information's free. You send it around. Someone estimated at, at Berkeley, a professor at Berkeley, how much bits of information go around the world in 24 hours. It's not a number that has a name on it. It can only be expressed mathematically. It was something like 10 to the 22nd power, some spectacularly big number. And uh, Naoki, my friend APO over there, he and I did, worked at the World Bank. And the World Bank, one of the vice presidents there, he was actually a managing director, wanted to put a map on the wall, the lobby of the World Bank, a map the size of that wall showing global knowledge flows, how knowledge flows in the world any given day. It would be an electronic map. And I thought that was great. I jumped, I'll do it, I'll work on that. <laughs> and we began to think how you would do such a thing. Travel, patents, documents, articles, what people study in college, how many majors in certain, how many students go around the world, conferences, uh, books being translated into other languages and published. So we thought how to do it, but then, unfortunately, this man who commissioned it, he got arrested. <laughs> he was a crook, so the project disappeared. <laughs> but it's a great, but think about how global knowledge flows, how it flows in the world and how you can use it that way. Any other comments or questions with people? Sir. Well, uh, thank you. I, I think what, what you said about the intangibles, the intangible things is uh, essentially important, you know, uh, for the enhancement of productivity. Yeah, I quite agree. I think it's uh, also the case with a country like Japan, where the population has started to decrease. But don't you think the tangibles are also important? critically important for some other countries where the population is growing, 
where the, you know, so many number of youngsters are put into labor market where they need a job opportunity. So uh, there, uh, I think the tangibles are really needed, both the intangible and the tangibles. Even in the, in the, in the states, those who hold the intangible in their hand are gaining a lot of money. But those companies are not really offering enough job opportunities inside American market. Isn't it <laughs> true? You're absolutely right. <laughs> that, that's that's a, different, <laughs> a different set of issues, but you're absolutely right. There are no more jobs <laughs> in the United States. It is very, it's less and less every day, and the jobs aren't any good. That's absolutely true. You have to find, and that's an issue we can't discuss here today, but it's, it's I mean, the sense of the, I imagine there'll be more jobs for intangible use. For example, this is something you might want to think about. What do you think is the biggest industry in the world? I will personally give a free copy of my book. Now, some of you know the answer to this because I've told you. So, <laughs> What's the biggest industry in the world? In terms of money, not people, but cash. So it's not agriculture, which probably is the most people, but not the most money. What's the biggest industry in the world? Pardon? M money, finance. Now it's a bigger one. Information is a bigger one, but that's getting close. <laughs> advice. Giving advice is the biggest industry in the world, from law firms to investment banks, from psychologists to yoga teachers, from university professors, people like me, the APO people. Advice. What is the basis of advice? What's the action? What do you need to know to give advice? Knowledge, the use of rhetoric, how to speak, it's all intangibles. And then I read, and this is a, a big article, the American Economic Review, that 30% of the U.S. economy, and I would say this is true for any developed country, so it just happens to you, is based on persuasion. Persuasion. People make their living per I, talking you into doing something you aren't going to do on your own. <laughs> Buy this soap. Watch this show. Invest your money in this bank. <laughs> We're laughing, but it's I, I live in a town. I live outside of the city of Boston, a suburb. And the town is full of engineers. I didn't choose this, but it just happened to be that way. Full of engineers. So they teach. Every student in the high school has to learn calculus. It struck me, I had to learn calculus myself in high school. I hated it. I barely could pass it. I never thought about it for the rest of my life. So my daughter took it, and the same thing. And I went to the school board. It's a small town. You could talk. I said, why do you make everyone take calculus when less than 1% will ever think about it for the rest of their life? How about we teach rhetoric, the use of argument, how to frame an argument, rhetoric? It was like speaking Greek to a chicken. It's absolutely worthless. <laughs> they, they thought I was crazy. But everyone will use rhetoric for the rest of their lives. That's what we're doing here. We are, we discuss. We say, what's this idea? What's the value of this idea? What's the value of doing this rather than that? But no one ever teaches it because we still live in a tangible world. But so, there'll be more jobs in advice. My wife teaches yoga to middle-aged women. No, it doesn't make a fortune, but she's good at it and she likes it. Personal trainers. Everyone has a trainer now, either a psychic trainer or a physical trainer. There's all sorts of jobs that'll just replace the factory job. But I'd agree with you, tangibles are important. But the world is moving. Here's an interesting, what we call a factoid. If you're giving speeches or you like saying things quickly to people that get their attention. The GNP of the entire world weighs the same now as it did in the year 1900. Weighs the same. The physical weight of the GNP, if you could measure all the things produced in 1900, it weighs the same as it does today. But the GNP today is 15 times larger than it was in 1900. So for that huge expanse, 15 times bigger, it's all intangibles. In 1900, a lot of that GMP would be coal, steel, heavy things. I mean, it still might be, but it's 15 times larger. It must all be just stuff in your head. <laughs> the world is very much moving towards a roboticized, algorithm-based 
situation where intangibles will be the name of the game. But what you're bringing up is a very important point. There's many books written about this now. It's becoming a big issue. What will people do to earn a living wage? I mean, it's true throughout the world. Any other uh, questions or comments? Yes. Oh, mm. sorry. I only agree with you 50%. Pardon? I only agree with you said 50%. Knowledge is not enough yeah. for the current world. You need foresight. Knowledge is being in the past. Mm, that's a difficult thing. To, I would say knowledge, now this is my, the way I would think about it, I think foresight is an output of knowledge. And understanding is an output of knowledge. And meaning is an output. I think knowledge in a wide, we're not just talking about knowledge how to build a microphone. We're talking about general knowledge of how to run things. What percentage of knowledge, when we talk about knowledge in organizations and in countries, what percent of new knowledge do you think is not about machinery? Innovations. So if I tell you, innovations in a whole country. What percentage are physical innovations and what are other type? Do you know? About 20% of physical things and the rest are new ways to organize. I mean, I use, I, many people think the most successful company, let's say in the last 50 years or 100 years, was Toyota. It's certainly in the top, one of the top companies. What did Toyota have? What made them so successful are a set of ideas. It wasn't different steel. It wasn't a different type of engine. They developed different ways of working. Organizational ideas made them what they are. They went from number 27 to number one in car sales. That's a huge jump. So it's those sort of ideas. They're not necessarily technical ideas. I should have said that at the beginning or science ideas, they can be ideas, how do you organize people for work? How do you get better incentives? How do we pay people? When I was at IBM, they would pay individuals, their bonuses based on their individual effort. They got a new CEO, a man came in to run the whole firm, and he changed it. He said, we're gonna give people their bonuses based on their team rather than their individual effort. People went crazy. That's a very un-American thought, by the way. Americans like individualism. <laughs> so people, no, people won't work that hard because they have to share the bonus. None of those things happened. So that was an organizational innovation, just as important as a technical, and maybe more important, political changes, ways of organizing work, et cetera. So I'm being told <laughs> that uh, my time is up. I'll be around the rest of today and uh, tomorrow, and I'd like to thank you. I really found this a, a very, very interesting group to work with, and I'd like to thank you for your time and attention.